course, this is probably the highlight of the year for Novak, the Northern Virginia Astronomy Club. We have, as our 25th anniversary Stargaze guest speakers this evening, the legendary John Dobson. And we're honored to have him by the Smithsonian. And they had him for about four hours yesterday, and he straightened them out on a lot of uh, cosmology. So they're going to be rewriting some of the exhibit. Uh, John really doesn't need an introduction. Um, he turned 90 in mid-September, incidentally, and I want to wish him congratulations for that. But John is probably the most recognized amateur astronomer on the planet. He's probably been to more places than most, amateur, most astronomers to begin with. Um, Russia, you name it. Uh, we're very honored to have him. I'm not going to waste a lot of time. Um, on his, on his introduction, because really I can't scratch the surface, but he's going to speak to us this evening about cosmology, and also we'll take your questions naturally on anything, any, any subject matter you have. So I want to welcome John Dobson, ladies and gentlemen. out of a black hole is the second impossibility. We now have impossibility squared. <laughs> and there's a third impossibility. In order to get this stuff out of a black hole, it's going to come out as half matter and half antimatter because the, the fireball has to be all radiation. And when radiation cools off to material particles, we already know what it does. It's 50-50 matter and antimatter. So that's the third impossibility. So now it's impossibility cubed. Do I need to go any further? Now we used to consider 
that no matter how many evidences in favor of your model you have, that doesn't show anything. But one evidence against you, and you're dead. Now, the Big Bang people have never taken it that way. Impossibility one, impossibility two, impossibility three, and they're still going on with it. Anyway, so I have to replace the Big Bang, so let me do that. So, I'll start the way I started in Italy. I had to talk to the big shots in Italy. And so I said, let's confine ourselves to the observational evidence. And since there is no observational evidence for creation, we'll leave it out. Now that leaves out the big bang people, the mini bang people, the steady state people, the Bible Belt people, and leaves out almost everybody. Anyway, so if we stick to our... I wish this thing would hang on my neck or something. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, if we confine ourselves to the observational evidence, what we see is that all those distant galaxies appear to be running away from us. And the farther away we look, the faster they appear to be running away from us. And although the simplest explanation is that long ago there was this explosion, still if we stick to the observational evidence, all we know is that out there, the, the redshift of all on those things, do you all understand redshift? Does anybody not understand redshift? If you don't understand redshift, please put it down. One hand will do. <laughs> redshift is something that happens in radiation. But if you don't know about that, you do know about fire engines. Uh, the, the, um, when a fire engine is coming toward you, the bell has a high pitch. And when it goes past you, it goes away with a low pitch. Ding, 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 goes away with the lower pitch like that. And as I always say, the reason that it slurs like that is because the fire engine missed you. <laughs> anyway, so radiation does a similar thing. If something is coming toward you, the spectral lines are shifted toward the blue end of the spectrum. That's the high energy end of the spectrum which corresponds to the high pitch of the bell and the fire engine. And when it goes away, the, the radiation is shifted to the lower end, low end of the spectrum, the red end of the spectrum, that's called red shifted. So what we see when we look way out there is that all those, the, the radiation from all those distant galaxies is red shifted. And the farther away they appear to be from us, the more red shifted they are. And the usual interpretation of the redshift is that they're going away. Now, I don't mind taking it that way. There are some other possibilities, but I don't mind taking it that they're going away. So out there, they're running away so that they would be approaching the speed of light going away at about 15 billion light years away. About 15 billion light years away, their energy would go, their radiation would go to zero energy because of redshifting. Now, if we consider the region just a little ways this side of where they would go to the to, to zero energy. What we see is that the redshift of the radiation means that the energy of the particles is extremely low. The way we find out the energy of a particle is to ask its radiation. That's how we find out. And if the energy of the particle, if the radiation way out there is very low, then the particles themselves have very low energy. Now, if the particles have... Oh, I've got to write some things on the board. You're going to have to wait. You're going to have to wait. I forgot he gave me a nice white board. Now, you see, the reason we write equations is because it's just as easy to translate them into Japanese <laughs> or Russian or German or French or English, and I'll translate them into English. But I have three equations to put on the board, you see. So the first two are Einstein's equations. S equals S squared equals X squared minus T squared. Can you see the S? S squared equals that. And E equals M. And uh oh. Uh oh. Out of there. All right. Now 
I'll translate it for you. This is Einstein's 19.5 geometry. What he noticed was that distances are not objective. How far it is from New York to Chicago depends upon how fast you're going by when you look at it. And lengths of time are not objective. What you call a minute or an hour depends upon how fast you're going by when you look at the clock. All right, let me give you an example. Suppose we have two spaceships <laughs> because they're lickety split. These people see those clocks are spinning around too fast. These people see those clocks are spinning around too fast. After they pass each other, these people see those clocks have slowed down. And those people see those clocks have slowed down. Now whose clocks have slowed down? There is no such thing as how fast the clock is going. No. I know, you'll say, I'm going to go along with the damn clock. <laughs> That's entirely arbitrary, and the rest of the universe is not going along with your damn clock anyway. So there's no such thing, you see. Einstein knew that distances are not objective and lengths of time are not objective, and he wanted to know what is objective. The S, this is objective. The space-time separation between here now and there then is objective. The space-time separation between two events, here now and there then, that's objective. So this is the distance between here and there, and this is the time between now and then. Now what Einstein's geometry pointed out is that the time comes in squared with a minus sign. Now you remember you all studied Euclid's geometry when you were in high school probably, and you remember every time you square something it's got a plus sign. No, it's got a minus sign. <laughs> the square of the time as a minus sign. You have to subtract the time separation from the space separation, and if they're equal, this goes to zero. Now you might think that's a trivial case. It's not a trivial case, because if a light beam can get from here now to there then, or from there then to here now, then the distance between here and there is equal to the time between now and then, and the total separation goes to zero. All right, now that's just one equation. Now this is e equals m. You already heard it with the c squared on there. But that's just how many ergs equals a gram. When Einstein found out they were measuring the same thing in grams as we're measuring in erg, he has to know how many ergs makes a gram. And an erg is the kinetic energy of a two gram libido walking one centimeter per second and running into your shoe. That's the kinetic energy. One erg is how much trouble you'd be in if the beetle ran into your shoe. The gram is the energy of the Hiroshima bomb. And he had to know how many beetles do we have to have to get rid of Berkeley. <laughs> anyway, that's what the C squared is all about. Nine times ten to the twentieth. The kinetic, carefully handled, the kinetic energy of 9 times 10 to the 20th, 2 gram beetles, walking 1 centimeter per second, would vaporize work. So this just simply says that what we call matter was just potential energy. Now we got that in 1905. We got both of these in 1905. This we got from Heisenberg in 1927. But he blames it on Einstein. Heisenberg says, for three solid months, for more than three solid months, they tried to describe the track of an electron across the cloud chamber, which they can see. They tried to describe it in quantum mechanics, and they couldn't do it. These are the biggest shots in quantum mechanics. <laughs> Heisenberg, Bohr, and Schrodinger, and they couldn't do it. And Heisenberg says, then I remembered and suggested that Einstein had made earlier. Theory must per se what can be observed. And when I looked at the problem from that side, I had the uncertainty relation. <coughs> so what this says is that the product of our uncertainty in where something is, and our uncertainty in what it's doing, its momentum, can never be less than this little guy whom we don't have to know anything about. Well, the reason we don't have to know anything about this guy is because he doesn't get bigger or smaller. 
Bob Scott said doesn't get bigger and smaller, two doesn't get bigger and smaller, and pi doesn't get bigger and smaller in flat space. So this stays the same size. And what this says is that our uncertainty here, multiplied by our uncertainty here, cannot go to zero. Our, there's a, it's your uncertainty that can't go to zero. Your uncertainty can't go to zero. So that's what this says. So if you know where something is, you can't know what it's doing. And if you know what it's doing, you can't know where it's doing it. <laughs> now back to the border. Now back to the border. Way out there, where the momentum, where the uh, radiation as seen by us approaches zero, the energy of the particles approaches zero. If the energy of the particles approaches zero, the mass of the particles approaches zero. If the mass of the particles approaches zero, the momentum approaches zero. The momentum is the mass modified by the velocity in some particular, well, the speed in some particular directions. Anyway, so if the momentum approaches zero, our uncertainty in the momentum approaches zero. You can't have a big mistake about nothing. If the momentum approaches zero, the uncertainty in the momentum approaches zero. If the uncertainty in the momentum approaches zero, the uncertainty in where they are goes to totality, and they can recycle back anywhere. Anyway, I don't see any way to avoid that understanding physics the way we understand it now. You would have to change the physics to get out of this. Anyway, so as I see it, the stuff recycles from the border. So there is this question which somebody, everybody fails to ask me about it. How come it recycles as hydrogen and not as iron? <laughs> well, as, seen, as I see it, it goes like this. As seen by us, if the mass is going very, very low, then this size of the particles has to get very big because things are wound up against electricity by being small. And if, the, if their size goes bigger, then their mass goes down. Or if their mass goes down, their size gets bigger. So way out there, as seen by us, the mass is going down, the sizes are getting bigger, and the molecules can't hold together, the atoms can't hold together, and they come back as protons and electrons. I'm going to give you my one-liner. The universe is made out of protons and electrons. It talks French and knows how to spell it. <laughs> I really don't think the people who believe in intelligent design have even smelled the problem. <laughs> it's made out of protons and electrons, and it talks French and knows how to spell it. Well, anyway. So as seen by us, the stuff is going to recycle from the border. Now there's a question. We have to know what is the evidence that recycles from the border. There's a lot of evidence now. When I first came up with this idea, we had only a little bit of evidence, but we got scads of evidence now. The uh, Hubble telescope was asked to look to see about the Lyman Alpha forest between 3C273. I'll tell you what it means. The, uh, 3C273 is a quasar, and it's, it's close enough to us so that the ultraviolet light reaches us in the, in the, in the ultraviolet and can't get into the atmosphere. So the Hubble telescope is outdoors. So we asked it to look at it, to see if there are any clouds of hydrogen between 3C73 and ourselves that are going away from us at different speeds. And the Hubble telescope said there are a whole flock of clouds of hydrogen between 3C273 and ourselves going away at different speeds. And so each one makes a shadow in the spectrum and there are a whole lot of shadows, that's called the Lyman Alpha Forest. So that's an old piece of evidence. And the Hubble telescope also said that there's more than enough uh, hydrogen in the intergalactic voids to make all the known galaxies. <coughs> now in recent times we found there's dozens, dozens of galaxies that are only a few hundred, thousand, a few hundred million years old, and they couldn't possibly be as old as the Big Bang we said they should be. Anyway, so there's a lot of observational evidence you see on my side that says no to the Big Bang model. Anyway, so there's another problem. The Big Bang people always thought that the background radiation which they discovered in Penzias and Wilson discovered in 1965 was the proof of their theory. Well, you can't prove it there. You can disprove it. It's been done several times. Anyway, so how do I get the background radiation? It turns out that way out near the border, where the mass of the particles is very low, all radiation going through a field of low mass particles gets so often picked up and 
to irradiate it, then it gets thermalized to 3K. Now the amount of 3K background radiation that we get in this model corresponds to what we measure. And the Big Bang gets about 1% of what they predict. The measurement is about 1% of what the Big Bang predicts, and it is the amount that this one predicts. Anyway, so what else do we need to talk about this? Anyway, the way I see this thing, the fun part is this. We have a rule against perpetual motion machines, <laughs> okay, because the entropy tends to a maximum. Do any of you not know what entropy means? Put up your hand if you don't know what entropy is. That's one hand of time. Anyway. Entropy is a measure of the scrambledness of the energy. And the way we put that is that it's easier to scramble an egg than to unscramble it. If you have any doubts, you can try it in the kitchen. <laughs> so the rule is that entropy tends, scrambledness of the energy tends to go up and does not tend to go down. And for that reason, you can't have a perpetual motion machine that takes energy in, in a more scrambled state and runs it out in a less scrambled state. It always goes the other way. It gets it in, in a less scrambled state and dumps it out scrambled. I should tell you a story. I was in Chile not very long ago, and I was talking to what I think was a professor of physics from Colombia. And there was a young man there, and we were talking about entropy going up. And this young man suddenly blurted out that he's a source of negative entropy. I said, the hell you are. When you eat it, it's brownies in half an hour. And you know where it goes after that. <laughs> and he couldn't stop laughing. He said he couldn't stop laughing. Anyway, so you see in my model, the stuff recycles from the border as brand new hydrogen sprays all out to sea. And that's the lowest state of entropy known to man. Hydrogen all spaced out is the lowest state of entropy, and then it falls together by gravity, the entropy goes up, and all these other things happen, the entropy keeps going up and going up. But as I see it, when it recycles from the border, the negative entropy is back in. Now, you're not supposed to like, or like what I had to say, and you're supposed to get on my case and make me take it back. <laughs> not that you'll succeed. <laughs> I want some complaints. Where would we be without Berkeley? <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't have a degree in chemistry if I didn't have Berkeley. But I, I like to make fun of the people I know. <laughs> and that's why I did it on Berkeley. <laughs> Where is the background radiation that they're measuring coming from? Where's what? Where, where, what is the origin of all the background radiation uh, that we see in the universe coming from? There? I just said, all the radiation running through low mass through low mass particles gets picked up and re-radiated and picked up and re-radiated and it comes in thermalized at 3 degrees Kelvin. And the amount of background radiation that you get this way corresponds to what we measure. I already said that. How do you explain the 25% helium? The what? The 25% helium? If everything's coming in as protons, how do you get the helium? Well, first of all, you have to remember that the, the, those, some, of, some of those numbers were put in before we knew that all the red giants dump hydrogen and helium out. See, we didn't know how stars went when they did all this stuff. You must realize that. We didn't even know there were neutron stars in those days. We didn't know that until it was 67. And uh, anyway, so uh, we have a lots of stars of, uh, of helium besides uh, besides the Big Bang. We don't have to get to helium. Helium out of the Big Bang. But if you look at stars that have very low fractions of heavy elements, they have about 25% helium, even though they don't have all the other stuff, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, that the red giants are. All right, now I'll give you another piece of information. I wrote to Sir Fred Hoyle because in my model, I wasn't at all sure that helium could it recycle from the water as well as the hydrogen. Because the helium is a pretty tightly bound thing and it's pretty bloody small. And I didn't have any reason to think that the helium couldn't recycle the same way the hydrogen did. Anyway, I got an answer from Joan Hoyle that Fred Hoyle, that Sir Fred, cannot answer the mail. I wrote back, I knew perfectly.
pretty well he wasn't going to answer the mail. And I said, it's a problem beyond be on the call of duty for you to have answered the mail. <laughs> anyway, I have a notion that he took it seriously or he wouldn't have had me answered at all. But I, I, I'm not able to do that kind of a calculation. But I don't have any reason why we can't have helium recycling from the border by itself. But I don't have a, I don't have a number on how many we've got. But like your model, this would be a constant process. But if you, if there's black holes in the universe and those uh, are accumulating energy and not releasing it, then you're going to have less and less energy within the universe, and eventually you're not going to have the recycling process. Now you see, I have a problem on the black holes too. I have a notion that this stuff recycles from black holes through Pauli's exclusion principle. Pauli's exclusion principle says that you cannot put two Fermi particles in the same energy state. And the things that are going into the black holes are Fermi particles, they're neutrons, okay? Now, neutrons are Fermi particles and we can only put two of them in the same place. And I'm pretty sure they run out of shelf space and this stuff recycles out as quasars, one on either side. Now you see, if they fell into a black hole, they've lost their rest value. If they recycle from a black hole, they're going to recycle with low rest value and high redshift. And what we see is quasars on either side of these big black holes, and they have very high redshift, and they're not going to be going away. Wait a while, please. detroit here because i have to tell you i have to present something here you see so uh, long ago there were some physicists who said that the whole universe was made out of energy we europeans were so retarded that we didn't notice energy until 1845 i'll say it again we europeans were so retarded that we didn't notice any such thing as energy till 1845 but there were some physicists of the cells in this world who four or five, probably five or thousand years ago said the whole universe is made out of energy and their name for the universe was Jogot, the changing. Their name for this thing is the changing. But they're physicists and they said if the universe is the changing, there has to be something with respect to which it changes. So there has to be an unchangeless underneath. And if it's not in time, it can't be in space. So it has to be changeless, infinite, and undivided. Then their problem was, if what exists is changeless, and what we see is changing, how the hell do you do that? And they said it can only be by mistake. You can't change the changeless, but you could mistake the changeless for the changing. So they said, we'll have to study mistakes. In order to mistake one thing for another, you have three things to do. First, you have to fail to see what it was. That's the veiling power of your mistake. Then you have to jump to the conclusion that it was something else. That you do on your own hooks. That's called the projecting power of the mistake. But in the first place, you had to see the thing in the first place, or you never would have made the mistake that way. In order to mistake a fr your friend for a ghost, you had to see your friend. Your friend shows through in the ghost. So those old physicists said the changeless has to show through in our physics. That's inertia. The infinite has to show through in our physics. That's the electrical energy of the minuscule particle. And the, cha and the undivided has to show through in our physics. And that's why they all fall together by gravity. Now it's not as though we Europeans had another explanation for any of this. We don't. We don't. We don't. We have only an explanation of how things fall, not why they fall. And how they coast, not why they coast. Uh, that they are made of electricity, and not why they're made of electricity. Those old physicists had the why answer on this. So if you ask what's beyond the observable universe, and the observable universe, as we see it, is due to a mistake, you see. And you want to know what's beyond the mistake, it's the changeless, the infinite, the undivided. Thanks for making me put that all there. <laughs> what? If it's moving away from us at such a fast rate of speed, how fast are we moving away from it? 
you have to be a little careful. We're sticking to an observational universe, and your left eye is at the middle of its observational universe, and your right eye is the middle of its observational universe. Anyway, all we see is that things are moving away from each other. But if you're at the center of an observational universe, then as seen by you, they're going away from you. You see, redshift is not an actual thing. This is not an actual model of a universe. It's not a model of an actual universe. It's a model of an observational universe. And that's the big difference between this model and all the other cosmological models. All the other cosmological models have taken the universe to be actual. What do we mean by actual? We mean that it arises by a process in physics. Since universes are fairly well known not to arise by processes in physics, I don't think we have any, any actual universes. I think we're stuck with observational physics. I think this stuff we wrote on the board is about an observational universe, not about an actual universe. Can you talk about dark matter and dark energy? Thank you. <laughs> well, dark energy I won't do, but dark matter I will. <laughs> uh, I asked three astronomers in the last 25 or 30 years this question. When a cluster of stars is formed out of a cloud of dusty hydrogen, what proportion of the stuff makes into the stars? And what proportion is blown away by the stellar wind? Now the first two, and this is many years ago and on very different occasions, they had about the same thing to say. They said they don't have an immediate answer on that, but they thought that between 1 and 10 percent would make it into the stars, and between 90 and 99 percent would be blown away. Now the third man I asked in more recent time, he said 95 percent is blown away. He get a number up there anyway. 95 percent is blown away, and in some cases more, and in some cases less. <laughs> So the question is, what is all this dark matter? It's blown away from when the stars were formed. Now when a galaxy is formed, it's just a cluster of stars, and 99 or 95, we'll say, percent of the stuff is going to be blown away. Now that's what we see. Vera Rubin measured uh, the, this for NGC 4565, the central body is this shape, and, this, and the disk is as flat as a plate. And around it is all the rest of this stuff, which is ten times as much as the stuff as we see in the galaxy, okay? So the dark matter, I think, is perfectly ordinary matter. And another interesting thing is that in recent times, we've discovered that more than, that about half of the neutron stars that we know about have escape velocity from the galaxy. That's 300 miles a second. Now these are neutron stars with a density of 100,000 battleships in a one pint jar, and they're about 10 or 12 miles in diameter, and they weigh a hell of a lot. And they're leaving the galaxy. And they're dark matter, and they're too bloody small for you to find, okay? They're not gonna shine for you. Anyway, I think that the dark matter is ordinary matter. I don't think we need any fancy stuff like the, the, the Big Bang people need. The Big Bang people needed all that fancy stuff because their inflationary models said that it has to be in there. And then they ran into this difficulty. Their inflationary models said it has to be in there. And uh, uh, the difficulty is that if there's all that extra stuff in here, out of which hydrogen and helium could be made, then the Big Bang model is wrong. Well, it's wrong anyway, but never mind that. <laughs> but if, this or if, if, the, if all this extra matter is ordinary matter, then the helium abundance is not okay for the Big Bang model. So then they had to invent that this dark matter responds only to gravity. It doesn't know about anything else except gravity. So then I was having a dinner with a physicist in Oregon a couple of years ago. I said, in that case, why didn't it fall into the galaxies? Why is it around the galaxies? Oh, he said, it can't fall into anything without getting rid of its gravitational energy, and it has no way to do that. <laughs> so what's the use of the dark energy, dark matter? It can't do anything. <laughs> anyway, that's a problem with the dark matter problem. <laughs> so then the dark matter that they invented said that the universe should be 
not expanding so fast. And they found that it's expanding too fast. So then they had to invent the dark energy to make it speed up. Well, if you want to invent all these things, you can get out of any model. <laughs> One of the troubles with the Big Bang is they invented the initial conditions so that it would come out like this. <laughs> well, that's not usually the name of the game. <laughs> you're, supposed to, you're supposed to look to see what the initial <laughs> ingredients might have been, but they invent them so that it comes out like this. But anyway, I don't take serious. I don't take seriously dark energy or dark matter. Dark matter, as I see, we already know that we see only a little bit of the universe that's up there. Vera Rubin measured it a long time ago. We know where it is, and I have a good idea what it is. What else? Yeah. What is the mechanism for recycling hydrogen? I already told you that Heisenberg does it, as seen by us, way out there. The redshift is going to zero. The redshift is going to, to totality out there, okay? Now, if the redshift goes to totality, we have to understand that the energy of the particles approaches zero. If the redshift approaches zero energy, then the energy of the particles approaches zero energy. If the energy of the particles approaches zero, the mass approaches zero. We got E equals M up here. If the mass of the particles approaches zero, the momentum approaches zero. If the momentum approaches zero, our uncertainty in the momentum approaches zero. If our uncertainty in the momentum approaches, un approaches zero, our uncertainty in where they are goes to hell. I don't see any way out of it, really. I don't see any way out of it if we just look at what we see. Yeah. If our grandchildren look back 90 years from now, what portion of the new advances in physics will be Eastern inspired? To You're not asking much. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to predict how physics is going to go? You remind me of myself. I heard, I heard Crick give a lecture one time. And at the end of his lecture, I asked him in a real roundabout way a question. He says, You're asking me about the origin of life. I said, I know what I'm asking you. <laughs> but the audience didn't notice. <laughs> anyway, I'm not going to be able to predict what's going to happen. But I have a feeling that what's going to have to happen is that the physicists are going to have to learn to read. Because the way the physicists have taught you at school is that this means that matter can be converted to energy. That's the way they taught it to you at the university. I know perfectly well what they did. And that's not this equation. That would be E plus M equals a constant. If mass goes down, the energy goes up. If the energy goes down, the mass goes up. There's only one way to write that, E plus M equals K. And that's not Einstein's equation. This is Einstein's equation. And Einstein never took it the other way. He always took it the way he wrote it. And the question is, why didn't he clean up the academic community? He stayed here for 55 years up. 1955, 50 years after he wrote that equation, and he never cleaned it up. Why? I don't think he ever saw how it was taught at school. If you were teaching school and Einstein is visiting in your class, are you going to talk relativity? The movie has to get you in their white room. Anyway, I don't think he ever saw what was being done there. And when the physicists did their programs, they would have written his equation and put in the numbers in his equation and gotten the right answer. I don't think Einstein ever knew how it was done. He never changed it the way he put it in his words. He said toward the end of his life, he said, matter had fallen out of the physics. Matter had fallen out of the physics as a fundamental concept. We're left only with energy. Anyway, that's how I see that. But that's going to have to be cleaned up. The physicists can't be this retarded permanently. <laughs> You've met enough of them you ought to know. I've known a lot of them, more than most people have. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you answered this, but where's the recycled hydrogen appearing in the universe? Uh, Everywhere. Randomly? Everywhere. <laughs> Anywhere. You see, otherwise the negative entropy wouldn't stay up. The, the 
The lowest state of entropy is hydrogen all spaced out. And then it falls together to galaxies and stars and the entropy goes up and all these other things and the entropy goes going up until it goes out there and recycles. What else? All right, what? Would you just comment on the fact that the first equation that S always goes to zero? There is no acceleration because S is zero only if X is equal to T. If X is equal to T, then S is always zero. Now you see the interesting thing is that our evidence that the universe is out there and in the goddamn pendant of us is that we look out there and see it out there. And the equation says that that's all, that evidence is against you. The separation between every event that you've seen out there and your seeing of that event has always been zero. Now we knew it was like that when we were dreaming. We didn't know that it's better than that when we were awake. I'm not responsible for any of those equations. I'm just here. I'm just your tour guide. Oh, I should tell you something, you see. I do this, I give these talks in Hollywood in front of them. And at the, the church, at the Bernardo Center, you see, there are all these monks lying around loose. <laughs> and people, people ask me questions, you see. So I tell them, I'm just your tour guide. I'm here to tell you where you are and how you got here. If you want to get out, talk to the people in orange. Laplace once said that. Who did? Laplace. Yeah. Laplace said that if you knew everything about a system at some point, then you could predict exactly everything that was going to happen. And then Heisenberg came along and said that's not true. That's correct. And Heisenberg has won it. Heisenberg's won the battle, but I thought Heisenberg said you can't measure it. He didn't say that it's not the case. He said you can't measure it. Well, if you can't measure it, you can't find out about it. Just because we don't know the answer doesn't mean the answer is exactly Well, it might not be like that. But you see, there's a question, you see, whether the way we see the universe is the way it really is, or whether there's something underneath that we didn't notice. Now, the way I understand it from those old physicists is that there's something underneath which we didn't notice. And the interesting thing about the way they said it is this, that they have an answer for why inertia shows, why gravity shows, why electricity shows. We have no answer at Caltech. We know how things fall, we know how they coast, we know how they're electrical, we don't know why. Now those old physicists gave us a way of looking at this thing that says why. If you mistake one thing for another, the one thing has to show. And they said what's underneath has to be changeless, infinite, and undivided, and it has to show through. And the change which shows through is inertia. The infinite is electrical energy, and, the under and gravity is the undivided showing through. It shows through in us, too. Everybody runs after peace and security. That's running after the changes. Everybody runs after freedom. That's running after the infinite. And everybody runs after happiness. We all get married and have children. And we, I don't have to explain it. <laughs> <laughs> and you're restricted to the pursuit of happiness, not to its attainment. It's written. <laughs> We're restricted to the pursuit of happiness, not to its attainment. Anyway, you see, if this whole thing is due to a mistake, there's a reason why it's made out of frustration. Well, I should tell you another thing about my model. My model says that the universe is going to be made out of frustration. <laughs> so I was asked to give a talk at the lady at the pretzel farm in the you know, Sierra. That's in California. Do you understand a pretzel farm where all those folded yogis are? <laughs> anyway, the lady who runs the press farm in the Sierra asked me to give a talk on frustration. I thought, how can anybody give a talk on frustration? But I did it anyway, and I had so much fun, I did it again later. So I'll tell you how it went. I said I was walking down through Griffith Park, that's in Los Angeles, in the winter season, the rainy season, and there's this little stream of water coming along beside me. And I was thinking that the poets say it will be happy when it reaches the sea. But the poets are wrong, you know, it won't be happy when it reaches the sea. The 
see is trying desperately to get to the center of the earth, and the rocks are in the way, and it's just frustrating. <laughs> it's going to get worse. Cheer up. It's not going to get better. So the rocks are trying desperately to get to the center of the earth, and the iron of the earth's car is in the way, and the rocks get frustrated. And the iron of the earth's car is trying desperately to fall into the sun, and its inertia is in the way, and it goes round and round at 18 miles a second. And it gets frustrated. And the sun is trying desperately to fall into the center of the galaxy. And its inertia is the way it goes around 150 miles a second. And it gets frustrated. And the galaxy has been trying to merge with all the rest of the matter of the observable universe. But the expansion is in the way. And it gets frustrated. And the expansion has been trying to reduce the density of the universe. But the recycling is in the way, and it gets frustrated. Now, if the universe weren't made out of frustration, it couldn't go on like this. There's no way out of it. If the universe were not made of frustration, it could not go on like this. Now you can fire me if you want. Oh, yes. Your model of the universe is observation with Hang on, let me get over where I can hear what the heck you're saying. <laughs> is your, is your model of the universe observational invariant space time? So what do you mean invariant in space time? No matter where you are, no where you are, you always look the same. Well, obviously it doesn't. It looks different in California. Why ask me that? <laughs> <laughs> no, there's nothing invariant about how it looks to all of us, to a lot of us, and it looks different to a whole bunch of us, you see. But if you ask yourself the fundamental question is what's underneath, then I think it comes out the same. I think what's underneath is the change is the infinite, the undivided. And that there's no other way to do this except making a mistake. But you're not required to make a mistake. I think it's time to fire me. <laughs> Anybody have any questions about Mr. Dobson's telescope? Though? Exactly, that was my question. Yeah. Can, I, yeah, how about tell us about it? can you can you tell us about the like what how you created the telescope or like what you were doing I at the didn't time? Create a telescope. Well, I <laughs> anyway. But what was going on at the time? You know, where were you? First of all, I have to tell you something. I'm famous for being too retarded to make an equatorial mount. <laughs> You're supposed to do something to get famous for it, but we just, we weren't going to do photography, we just wanted to see what's out there, and we made a 24-incher, that's more than 13-foot focal length, and we've run it for more than 80,000 miles in the public parks and in the Indian reservations up to Canada and down to Mexico. But we weren't going to do photography. We didn't need to track things across the sky. So we never did all that. That's all. So the people that need to be blamed are the people who invented those equatorial mounts. You should get on their case, not mine. <laughs> because that's an invention. What we did is not an invention. Anyway, I had, they were going to give me an, a, uh, an award for public service in astronomy in the East Bay Astronomical Society, so that they sweet talk you in front of the crowd, the Dobsonian Revolution, the Dobsonian Revolution. So I got up and said, all the previous revolutions were run with the cannons on Dobsonian Mount. <laughs> I don't understand how grinding a mirror underwater could be quieter than grinding it out. Try it! monastery and it was on, must be on our curriculum to grind telescope mirrors and these were just gallon jug bottoms and this little five and a half inch of things and I was doing them underwater so as not to make a stir. That's all. But we had enough stir anyway. Yes? With all the modern advances and everything and materials and so on, what, how would you build a new type of telescope or what would you do? You know there's a lot of lightweights with one or two tubes you know and 
you know, let's say a Dobsonian type. I mean, what would you do if, if you were to build a newer type telescope? Well, why would I want a newer type telescope? <laughs> an older type telescope do everything I need it done. Well, why is it time? I mean, why is it? There, there, there are a lot of people who like to invent things, hard, harder way to do things. I let them do it. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, but it's high time, you see, that the amateurs uh, did something else besides taking pictures with those four and six inches and looking at the pictures in the daytime with their cone cells. They're not going to see them with their cone cells through the telescope. They're going to see them with their rod cells. And the rod cells are wired the wrong way. For this whole bunch of cells, there's only one wire to the brain. And for this whole bunch, there's only one wire to the brain. So your resolution is between this bunch and this bunch, not between this house and this house. So you see, if you want to see what those pictures look like, take them in the closet and turn out the light, and <laughs> damn it all, they look just like what you see through the eyes. <laughs> <laughs> don't think I don't do all these things. I do. <laughs> Yeah. Do you, do you spend a lot of time observation, uh, observing uh, out on the fields, or, or are you... It's virtually impossible to entertain me at a star party. We run that 24-incher all over the country, you see. Well, not all over the country, but all into three, two other countries we run it. Anyway, and so I've had to aim that telescope for the public for a lot of... <laughs> an awful lot of nights, <laughs> a thousand nights. Anyway, so I've seen most of those things from seven to 10,000 feet through a 24-incher, you see. And my eyes are no longer as young as they used to be, and it's virtually impossible to entertain me at a star party. Now, I used to be able to see the middle star and the ring nebula through our 24-incher. So we were up on 5,000 feet at the Sierra, and there was this young lady there, and the pupils of her eyes were very big. When I gave her back her 12-inch mirror from the illuminizer, I noticed her pupils are very big. So I asked her to please climb up the ladder and see if she could see the central star in the ring. So she calls out, there are two stars inside, and there are two stars in the, in the up nebulosity, and she calls out the position angle. Well, that's all you see through the 120. <laughs> but you see, it makes a lot of difference. What's between your eyepiece and your brain? What's between your eyepiece and your brain? And I don't have very good eyes. When I was in Boston, when I was three years old, some big kid mud, rubbed mud in my eyes till it was behind the eyeballs, and the doctors thought I would be blind. Mother said it took one whole week for the mud to ooze out from underneath my eyeball. Anyway, so I don't have any straight lines, and I don't have a straight horizon in my right eye. But my brain reads my left eye. It doesn't must this one into it. I've had, nine, I've had 87 years to get used to it. And my brain knows which eye to read. It doesn't read this one. It reads this one. But if I'm not careful, I can see once in a while this picture intrudes, you see. Anyway, my eyes are no longer as good as they used to be. Yes. <laughs> What do you think about the popularity of amateur astronomy now versus 10 years ago? And what do you think in another 10 years? Well, I hope it keeps growing and not going to bed. But uh, if the amateurs don't get their telescopes out for the public, nobody will. The professionals make telescopes for the professionals. We sidewalk astronomers make telescopes for the rest of you. But the amateurs are going to have to do it. Now, I'll tell you one thing. I was in Seattle a few years back, and they've had star parties on the dark of the moon for decades on end. Probably for 100 years they've done it. Run off to the wilderness with their telescopes so they can look and lick their chops and go to bed. And now on the next week, when there is a quarter moon, they have a public star party in the old gas works park in Seattle, and they blame that one on me. <laughs> <laughs> but 
but they get quite a number of telescopes out there and several hundred people looking through them. So if the amateur, and a lot of amateurs do this kind of thing now, we sidewalk astronomers used to do it on every clear night. <laughs> but at any rate, I can't do that anymore. They run me all over the place in a plane. <laughs> I think it's time to fire me. <laughs> Anyway, you need to make telescopes so you can see what's going on out there. You can't see it any other way. Watching TV doesn't do it. They get all mixed up when they run the TV. And they get you all mixed up if you're not careful. Anyway, it's time to fire me. Any more questions? This man, who knows who will be back? I don't think John and I were talking. He's never visited no back before, so this is a real treat for us. So. <laughs> Oh yes, H2. <laughs> <laughs> Hey Mike, it's for a drink. I'm, I'm here. <laughs> Dusty night. <laughs> you have to be careful because the aliens start shooting back, so you can only use this laser. <laughs> Not bad. Yeah. Alex.